Welcome to the sixth episode of our video series on cattle farmer training, brought to you by the Karen Beef Academy. This video series will not only give you a good understanding of cattle farming and what needs to be taken into consideration, but will also assist you in becoming more profitable and sustainable as a cattle farmer. We will cover a wide range of topics throughout this series, aimed to inform you on best practice and enlighten you on some new techniques. We will also shed some light on challenges facing cattle farmers and how to overcome them. This episode focuses on the common illnesses that can impact the health of your cattle and why your animals must be vaccinated annually against notifiable and prevalent diseases. Your parasite control program should be applied according to regional requirements and in conjunction with your veterinarian's recommendations. Furthermore, no vaccination guarantees 100% prevention. So a very keen eye and time spent with one's animals is important for early syndrome detection. Vaccinate according to a program relevant to your specific area. Body Condition Score, or BCS, is the key indicator of a cow's reproductive performance that you can use. Ideally, first calf heifers should not fall below a body condition score of 3 before calving. Furthermore, BCS is a management tool designed to assess the nutritional status of your animals and the fat and muscle covering on an animal's body. This scoring system runs on a 1 to 5 point scale, where 1 is very thin and 5 is overweight. The primary factors in prevention of infertility, abortions, and low calf production lies in good herd health care and management. The best practice of introducing new cattle to your herd is to firstly minimize the risk of introducing diseases onto the farm. If disease is prevented, it cannot spread within the herd. Purchased cattle should be quarantined for a minimum of 21 days. Pay special attention to the health status of bulls. Purchased bulls can introduce disease and spread it venereally. Get your veterinarian to assess the health status of your bulls. Only purchase bulls from sources with a proven health status. Ensure that farm visitors and their equipment are clean before they enter the farm. Make sure your boundaries are properly fenced. Cattle that jump fences can often introduce diseases to neighboring farms. Isolating aborting cows and immediately removing aborted materials can reduce the spread of disease within the herd. Nutrition is key to sustained good health, so it is important to provide a sufficient quantity of properly formulated supplements in the right quantities. Cows under stress are more likely to become infected and to abort. Pregnant cows need good quality feed. Food that is contaminated with molds should not be fed to pregnant cows. Store feed properly and keep vermin out as they can spread bacteria and viruses, particularly salmonella. Vaccination is an integral component of a complete herd health program and is not a remedy for poor management. Many of the infectious diseases that cause abortions in cattle have vaccines available which are safe and effective. Work together with your vet to develop a vaccination program targeted at the diseases that are common to your area. Vaccines will not work if they are not properly handled or administered, so read and follow the instructions on the label and the package insert. Brucellosis is a highly infectious bacterial disease in cattle, goats, sheep, and humans caused by the bacterium Brucella abortus in cattle. 
Humans can get brucellosis from the consumption of infected raw milk and dairy products or by coming in direct contact with any secretion of infected animals. The disease has an enormous economic impact on the dairy and beef industry in South Africa and is widely spread throughout the country, especially where cattle are farmed intensively. Due to the economic importance of controlling ovine brucellosis, as well as the risk to public health, it is a notifiable disease and is controlled by the state. Infected cows will spread the bacteria in the aborted fetus, uterine discharge, and after birth. The infected cow can also excrete the bacteria through her milk throughout the entire lactation period. Other cattle may become infected by eating contaminated feed or water and by leaking infected afterbirths or vaginal secretions after the infected animals have calved or aborted. The infection can also spread through the mucous membranes of the eyes or unborn calves could get infected in the uterus. Infected calves can still be born normally but will be permanently infected after birth. If female, these heifers will continue to spread the disease when they calf. They will, however, test negatively until they have calved for the first time. The clinical signs of brucellosis in cattle include abortions, retained placentas, and swollen joints. Although abortions are one of the main symptoms of the disease, the infected cow will only abort once after which she will calve normally while remaining infectious. 90% of infected cows will remain infected throughout their lifetime. Brucellosis is diagnosed by testing lymph gland, fetal membrane, blood and milk samples. Animals that have tested positive for the disease are branded with a C on the right side of their necks and are preferably slaughtered immediately. Prevention will include vaccinating heifers between four and eight months of age and avoiding direct contact with aborted fetuses and afterbirths. Humans should drink only heat-treated or pasteurized milk. On a practical basis, most abortions occurring during the second and third month go undetected until the cow fails to calf or returns to heat. So abortion rates are usually calculated from 120 days onwards. Most heads have an abortion rate of around 1 to 2 percent, so a single abortion is no cause for alarm. An annual abortion rate of greater than 5 percent is considered to be the point at which intervention should take place. Abortions can be divided into non-infectious causes and infectious causes. Generally, it is the infectious causes that are important as they are more likely to be involved when many abortions occur at the same time, where more than 10% of cows are bought. Because there are specific control measures in place for many of these infectious diseases, it can be easier to identify them. However, non-infectious causes can be responsible for outbreaks of abortion as well. So identification of whether abortion is due to non-infectious or infectious causes is critical in any abortion investigation. A wide variety of infectious causes have been associated with abortion in cattle, ranging from diseases which cause abortion secondary to systemic infection, to those which specifically target the reproductive tract and cause abortion without any clinical signs. Any disease which results in a cow being sick and having a high fever can cause abortion. So valuable information on the cause of abortion can be identified if information is available on the cow's health before it aborts and if there were clinical signs, whether there were similar signs in cows which did not abort. Abortion without clinical signs is a common sequel to many of the infections that cause abortion, including some of the most important causes such as brucellosis, PVD, leptospirosis, and salmonella. The percentage of abortion cases for which a diagnosis can be made is very low, 
with one being made in less than one third of cases. The chances of making a diagnosis can be greatly increased by keeping accurate records. By doing so, the farmer will then be aware of when a cow was due to calf and when it aborted, what the cows have been fed on and when, the area in which the cow has been during pregnancy and the cow's vaccination status. Keeping the aborted fetus and fetal membranes and submitting them to a laboratory can greatly enhance the chances of a diagnosis. Trichomoniasis is a disease of the reproductive threat caused by trichomoniasis fetus, a microscopic flagellated protozoan parasite confined to the reproductive tract of the infected animal. It is transmitted from infected bulls to heifers or cows at the time of breeding. Conception will not occur in infected cows. If she is pregnant at the time of infection, the embryo will either be reabsorbed or aborted. As a result, the cow will continuously come into heat, which can ultimately lead to permanent infertility. In a bull with trichomoniasis, there are typically no clinical symptoms. However, transmission to cows, particularly heifers, leads to the death of the fetus through reabsorption or abortion. Vibriosis is caused by bacterial infection of the sheath of bulls and is the other major venereal disease transmitted by bulls to female cattle during the act of copulation. In contrast to trichomoniasis, vibriosis can be prevented through vaccination, but it will not necessarily provide complete immunity or prevent infection in some heifers. However, it will control the result of the infection. In infected bulls, vaccination can help get rid of the disease. Symptoms of both trichomoniasis and vibriosis are difficult to identify because neither the cow nor the bull appears ill at any time when they are infected with these organisms. The only signs of trichomoniasis or vibriosis are when there are reproductive problems in the herd. The first sign is usually an increase in the number of open and late calving cows. Keeping a closed head is the single most effective measure to prevent the spread of vibriosis and trichomoniasis. Vaccines can also protect cattle against the spread of trichomoniasis. Foot and mouth disease, or FMD, is a highly contagious viral disease of cloven-hoofed animals such as cattle, pigs, goats, sheep, and some species of game. Even though this disease can infect many animals, there is a low mortality rate. FMD is spread through direct contact from the infected animal to the non-infected animal. The virus lives in the saliva, expirated air, milk, urine, mucus from the nose, feces, and eye discharges from the infected animal. Indirect infection happens through animal tissues, secretion, and discharges or other objects, humans, or birds. Humans can spread the virus via their clothes and shoes and the mucous membranes. Infected animals can start infecting other animals before they start to show lesions or sores. The incubation period of the virus occurs from 2 to 8 days and the whole herd is usually infected by then. Animals will have a fever, they will not eat, milk production stops and there will be no room and movement. Lameness will follow the onset of these symptoms. The animal may not be able to stand or walk. Saliva will flow with some nasal discharge. The animal will also grind its teeth Blisters or sores will start to develop in the mouth, on the tongue, and between the cloves of the hooves. Cows can also develop blisters on their udders and teats. FMD is diagnosed based on the clinical signs. The virus will then be identified by taking samples from blisters or mucus from the throats of infected animals. 
Quarantine measures are set up during an outbreak and the movement of animals and animal products from infected areas are stopped. Bovine viral diarrhea is a disease of cattle caused by the bovine viral diarrhea virus. It is a serious and costly disease for cattle farmers and beef producers, especially in young herds and communal farming. The disease has several survival mechanisms in the way in which it affects its host. It not only has the ability to transiently infect animals, but it can also evade the immune system and persist under certain circumstances. Although the virus's name is explicitly associated with gastrointestinal disease, BVT appears to affect many of a cow's systems, including the reproductive, respiratory, and central nervous systems, to name a few. The most important economic repercussions of BVT are reproductive losses, and reproduction is the most important path of disease transmission within and among cattle populations via the generation of persistently infected carriers. Following the best practice of introducing new cattle to your herd, not moving your cattle, and by following certain protocols, you can help limit bovine viral diarrhea exposure on a farm. Avoid purchasing replacement animals through the auction market. These animals could have been exposed to other PVD-infected animals. Plus, they are usually heavily stressed and have limited immunity. Place purchased animals in quarantine for 14 to 21 days before introducing them to the herd. Animals who are incubating the bovine viral diarrhea virus may become noticeable before the entire herd is exposed. Set up a herd vaccination program against the virus and work with your veterinarian to outline vaccination protocols that will prevent illness. Always test new animals to ensure they are BVD negative. Carriers can shed so much virus that they can easily overwhelm even the best vaccination programs. Controlling bovine viral diarrhea is without question of the utmost importance. The method and goals of control will differ depending on the situation, but will usually involve the identification of persistently infected animals, biosecurity, and vaccination. To control PVD, each animal's status should be identified and any persistently infected animals must be removed from the farm. Try to prevent any new persistently infected animals being born on or introduced to the farm. Bovine viral diarrhea or BVD is one of those diseases that can attack an animal's immune system throughout its life cycle. In order to control the virus, it is important to understand how the virus works. The BVD virus can act in one of two ways. Either the virus infects an animal and the animal either dies or recovers. If the virus is spread to another host before the animal dies, the virus survives. If not, the virus dies along with the animal. Or the virus is passed from infected cows to their unborn calves. This can result in abortion. If these calves leave, those infected early in pregnancy can remain infected all their lives and are considered persistently infected. These animals will continue to shed the virus to other animals in the herd. If you are bringing pregnant heifers into the herd, keep them separate from the main herd until they calve and then sample the resulting calves. If the calves are negative, their mothers will be too. If the calf is positive, test the mother to determine her status. If both are positive, then each will have to be removed. BVT infection can also occur through contact exposure with other infected animals or contaminated formites like water buckets, calf feeders, feed banks, vaccination equipment, people's clothing, and cattle trucks. Persistently infected animals present a unique challenge. If a pregnant cow is first exposed to bovine viral diarrhea between days 42 and 125 of gestation, 
the virus will persistently infect the fetus due to its lack of a developed immune system. In these cases, the pregnant cow will develop antibodies to the virus. However, persistently infected calves will continue to shed a significant amount of virus during their lifetime. Symptoms of PVD can vary based on the exposed animal's immune status and the strain of the virus they are exposed to. BVDV1 strains are known to occur more often, while BVDV2 strains are considered more virulent. If unvaccinated animals are infected with BVDV, the resulting disease will likely appear as an acute, severe sickness characterized by bloody diarrhea, high fever, lack of appetite, mouth ulcers, and pneumonia. Some animals may die while others will recover within a few weeks. Antibiotics are an ineffective treatment due to the viral nature of the disease. The treatment of BVD is limited primarily to supportive therapy. Once identified, infected animals should be culled. It is important to understand that vaccination against the BVD virus with most vaccines currently available only protects against the clinical effects of the disease in the animal but does not protect against infection. Vaccinated animals will still get infected and develop a viremic state and may continue to shed virus to the environment. This means pregnant animals in a viremic state, whether previously vaccinated or not, have the potential to infect the fetus with the virus. Depending on their stage of pregnancy at the time of infection, this can lead to the birth of persistently infected calves. Therefore, vaccination does not necessarily equal fetal protection unless the specific vaccine chosen has a fetal protection claim substantiated by scientific data. Annual vaccination programs can increase the amount of circulating antibodies in the cow. If the vaccine is administered at pregnancy check, which would be in autumn for spring calving herds, the cow will then have enough time to be at peak antibody level before she starts making colostrum. This would also increase the level of antibodies transferred to the calf and help establish an immunity foundation right away once the calf is born and consumes the colostrum. It is crucial to choose the correct product when vaccinating your herd against BVD, as some vaccines are designed specifically for fetal protection, and this claim can be substantiated by science. Others are designed to protect only against the immunosuppressive effects of BVD and will not protect the fetus. Calf diarrhea can occur for several reasons. It can result from inadequate nutrition, but also the reaction to an infection by pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. The major source of pathogens in the calf is its mother. Once the colostrum has been fed, removing the calf from its mother to an individual pen will reduce the risk of disease. Calf diarrhea usually starts five to seven days after birth because not only is there a decline in the secretion of antibodies from the calf back into the gut, but there is also a reduction in the antibody levels in the mother's milk. It is possible to maintain antibody concentrations within the gut and a significant prevention benefit by prolonging the feeding of colostrum. Diarrheal diseases are the most common and economically impactful diseases in newborn calves. In the first weeks of life, 75 to 85 percent of calf diseases are related to diarrhea. The reason for this is that calves are born without immune protection. Their immunity is primarily built up in the first 12 hours by the supply of colostrum. After that, the intestinal barrier is barely possible for the antibodies. There are different types of diarrhea, mainly the secretory and the malabsorptive forms. Because of frequent mixed infections, the two forms of calf scours are often combined. 
Secretory diarrhea is caused by the binding of toxins to the enterocytes or red blood cell surface receptors. Enzyme systems are then activated, leading to increased fluid secretion in the intestine. The intestinal lining will eventually no longer be able to absorb the increased fluid influx. The trigger for this can be, for example, an E. coli infection. In malabsorptive diarrhea, the enterocytes are destroyed and the villi are reduced in size. The result is a lower enzyme activity and reabsorption capacity. Because of the reduction in villi length, less fluid can be absorbed and will be excreted through the intestine, leading to dehydration. Colostrum supply is the most important basic requirement for a healthy start to life. The newborn calf should consume at least 2 to 4 liters of colostrum within the first 6 hours of life. In addition to the timing, the quality of the colostrum is key. Low colostrum intake or low quality colostrum at birth results in the failure of passive transfer due to the inadequate ingestion of colostrum immunoglobulins. Failure of passive transfer is associated with an increased risk of mortality and decreased health status. To avoid diarrhea in calves, it is primarily essential that the calf is protected from fluid losses. Measures can be taken in advance to protect the newborn calves from diarrhea. The most important symptoms of diarrhea are sunken eyes as an expression of dehydration, reduced intake of fluids, lying down, low temperature, cold body surface, and apathy or even coma. Parasite numbers vary according to season, location, and management. Good head management is therefore critical to avoid outbreaks of infection from these parasites. This includes good nutrition and a health program. Cattle can be infected by roundworms, tapeworms, and flukes. The medium or brown stomach worm and the cuperia species are the most common roundworms. Even though cattle can be infected with tapeworms, their effect on animal performance is minimal compared to roundworms. Problems with flukes arise in environments that promote snail populations, such as poorly drained pastures and stagnant pools of water in the pasture area. Immunity to worms starts to develop at about 5 months of age and is fully expressed by about 18 months. This immunity can be compromised during periods of very wet weather and poor nutrition. All these worms are prolific egg producers. Eggs passed out with the dung continue their development within the dung. If weather conditions are warm and moist, the resultant infective larvae move out of the dung and onto the grazing land in a form of moisture. If weather conditions are dry, Infective larvae can remain dormant and protected in the dung for up to 18 months until the next rains provide enough moisture for the larvae to migrate onto the grazing land. Infectious larvae can survive on pasture for about 3 months in summer and up to 6 months during winter. Very dry, windy conditions quickly kill infective larvae but many survive in the moist areas and grass around watering points. These surviving larvae are the source of reinfection. During periods of warm, wet weather, intake of large numbers of infective larvae during grazing results in an explosive buildup in worm burdens, often within a few weeks. Worms cause weight loss, poor milk production, feed efficiency, and fertility, especially around stress periods such as just before and after calving low-quality nutrition, and extreme weather such as droughts or cold. Adult cattle can develop a resistance against roundworms. Tapeworms live in the small intestine of calves and shared segments containing eggs into the dung. Immature tapeworms develop in a mite host and infect cattle when the mite is eaten with a grazing felt. 
They cause no known pathogenic effects and cows rapidly become resistant to them. The flux life cycle requires two hosts, cattle and snails. The adult flukes are found in the bile ducts of cattle. The eggs are laid in the ducts and expelled with the feces. A larval stage hatches from the egg and infects the snail, where it reproduces asexually. Specific stages of the juvenile fluke leave the snail and insist on aquatic vegetation. Cattle eat the vegetation and become infected. The fluke migrates to the liver, infects the bile duct, and matures into an adult. These parasites cause liver damage which will lead to poor body condition, fertility, and growth. They will also limit the storage of vitamins and minerals and thus supplementation will become ineffective. Cattle do not develop immunity against this worm group. Knowing whether your animal has worms or parasites is to identify the symptoms. General symptoms of worm infections are rough hair coat, diarrhea, emaciation, weight loss, or blood loss. External parasite symptoms are hair loss caused by lice, scabs indicating mites, lumps on the back from grub infestation, blood loss due to flies, sucking lies and ticks, and also weight loss. Treatment of calves should begin when they reach three to four months of age and again at weaning if they are kept as replacements or stalkers. Treating calves every three to four months may be necessary to optimize parasite control until the calves become yearlings. Yearlings can be treated on a seasonal basis in spring and autumn until they are mature cows. A mature cow is generally recognized as an animal pregnant with her second calf. If calves are backgrounded in a feedlot, one initial treatment should be sufficient. Nutrition determines the way in which cattle will grow, produce milk, and reproduce. Good nutrition will result in overall healthy animals with a strong immune system that can withstand parasites and cold or warm environments. If your herd has access to good quality feed, being grasses that are not exposed to fuels from cars or plastic when animals are grazing near main roads, the cattle are able to gain weight in a healthy internal environment. Thank you for watching. We do hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please follow our social media channels for more and make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to access the other videos in this series. Until next time, goodbye.